The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, one of the most influential games in the industry, and the top 20 most games ever sold, ever, is the best selling action RPG ever made, but is in the same profit bracket as Witcher 3 and Diablo 3. Pretty much everyone has either played it or knows enough about it to pretend like they have. So why talk about it? I'll talk about whatever I want whenever I want. But more than that, the Anniversary Edition came out not too long ago, and I want to focus on that as well as my usual overview. So strap up, or on, your preference, and relax as we talk about one of the most modded games of all time. Let's dive right into the overview. Side note, if you're just here to listen to what I have to think of the Anniversary Edition, skip to the end. You won't hurt my feelings. I'm starting with the first choice you're confronted with. What race you will play as in the frigid tundra of Skyrim. If you've watched my video on Morrowind, you're going to hear a lot of parallels. But not everything is the same for the races, beginning with the most common pick, Nord, the native race of Skyrim's locational setting. They have a passive 50% resistance to frost damage and the ability Battle Cry, causing the frightened status on nearby enemies for 30 seconds. Slithering in is the dirty beastie Scaly, the Argonian. They maintain their ability to passively breathe underwater, as well as a 50% resistance to disease. Their active ability, Hissed Skin, regenerates their health 10 times faster for one minute. Health starts at 100 at level 1, and natural regeneration outside of combat is 0.7%, 0.49% in combat. So if you activate this ability at level 1 with no health modifiers, you will be regenerating 7 health per second out of combat and 4.9 health per second while in combat. The Breton lose a bit of their magical prowess, but maintain a lot of magical defense. They have a flat 25% resistance to magic. This time around that includes fire, frost, and shock. They also come with an active ability, Dragon Skin, granting them 50% spell absorption and converting it to their own magicka from all incoming spells for one minute. Do note, spell absorption is a separate mechanic to resistance, the percent, in terms of spell absorption, refers to the chance to activate, quote, spell absorption, which will fully absorb a spell if triggered. Dark Elf, or Dunmer, gain a hardy 50% resistance to fire damage, and also come with arguably one of the worst racials in the game. Thematically dope, their active ability, Ancestor's Wrath, surrounds them in flames, dealing damage to nearby enemies. While this can be useful in the early game, it never scales its damage. No amount of gear, skills, or levels will ever increase its output. Next is the High Elf, or Altmer, who remains the most magical inclined and justifiably hated race of the franchise. Their passive increases their flat magicka, the magic resource of the game. They start at 150, other races at 100. Their active ability, Highborn, increases their Magicka regeneration at a rate of 25% of maximum Magicka per second for one minute. Imperials are treasure-seeking opportunists. They passively find more gold than other races anywhere gold can be found, such as chests or containers. Their active ability, Voice of the Emperor, is basically the opposite of Nords, setting the Calmed status on nearby people for 30 seconds. The dirty beastie Khajiit likes to get feisty with their claws, gaining a passive plus 15 base unarmed damage. They also have the active ability Night Eye, which grants them night vision for one minute. Night Eye is unique among the active abilities of the races, as you can use it as much as you want, essentially switching it on or off at will, where the others are limited to once per in-game day. The Orsimer, or more appropriately, Orcs, are, as always, big, bold, and sexy. They have the passive of, well, being an orc. Uh, what that means is they are automatically known as, quote, bloodkin, meaning they start as friendly with the orc strongholds of Skyrim. All of the other lesser races must complete a quest to earn that trust. They have their classic rage, taking half damage and dealing double physical damage for one minute. Redguard have a passive 50% resistance to poison, as well as the active ability Adrenaline Rush to keep them swinging away in the middle of combat, granting them 10 times stamina regeneration for one minute. Stamina is not nearly as important as fatigue was in Morrowind, but it's still incredibly important for attacks that utilize the resource. Now we have the Bosmer, or Wood Elf. They have a 50% resistance to both disease and poison, 
while maintaining their active ability, Command Animal, making surrounding animals be friendly for one minute. The skills in Skyrim are a lot easier to manage than previous installments of the franchise. Each skill still reflects your character's ability to perform well in that skill, but as you level, you now gain skill points, which you can assign in this astronomical talent tree. To level, you simply increase your skills. The higher the skill, the more experience you gain toward your next level. Assigning these skills can grant you a passive bonus or a whole new mechanic to that skill, such as a new attack maneuver for a weapon skill, the ability to overcharge spells by using both hands, or pickpocket the shirt right off of someone's back. Real quick here, I'm going to go over a pretty handy way to level up in this game, but I don't recommend it if it's your first time. It involves a little bit of uh, save scumming, but if you simply move one of those S's, the term becomes saves coming, and I find that much less offensive. Each level, you can train a skill at someone who knows what they're doing in that field up to five times. Obviously, they want a little something in return. Naturally, that comes in the form of gold. Well, shoot fire, we're just starting out. We're not Jeff Amazon, Elon Tesla, or Mark Facebook yet. We don't have those kinds of stacks. I guess we'll just have to take it back, which in turn also levels up your pickpocket skill in tandem with whatever skill you happen to be training in. This will level you up very quickly early on, but will eventually slow down, so we'll have to plan for some other skills to level in those gaps. Perhaps a little smithing, a little enchanting, a little alchemy, dapple in some magic here and there. You can ride this wave pretty far, but it's definitely cheese mode, and I wouldn't recommend it for those looking to dive in and have a fresh experience. With that fresh experience comes two main threads to the story of Skyrim, Dungans and Dargans with a dash of civil war, Fighting dragons is a combination of fun and frustrating, and dealing with the Civil War is like dealing with children. Both sides offer somewhat fair points mixed with a hard brand of stupidity, and you're shoehorned into hard committing to one or the other. Or, you know, you could just not deal with that part of the story and let them continue their petty dance of destruction. Discover what it means to be the Dover King. which means signing up for Twitter to learn how to shout really loud. You can find new emojis on these special walls that allow you to learn new trends to virtue signal at the top of your lungs. There are quite the variety of ways to virtue signal, from knocking people back, lighting them on fire, freezing them solid, or crippling a dragon's wings to force them to land and fight on the ground like a pleb. Choose to be a part of one or all of the guilds between the companions, a bunch of furries, the Thief's Guild, a bunch of crybabies, the Mage's Guild, a bunch of morons, or the Dark Brotherhood, a bunch of retards. Cap out your crafting skill to create every kind of armor or weapon you want, while being good enough at it to make even the starting armors reach the armor cap. So, like most games, it's all about the fashion. Raise your renown in every main hold, becoming a thane everywhere, owning housing and land all over Skyrim dive into the two main story DLCs, both of which hold their own quite well in regards to what I personally believe a DLC should represent to a game like this. Dawnguard offers a threat, or treat, your decision, of aggressive expansionist vampires set loose upon the land. It's up to you to either stop them or join them. In a conflict between an old sect of vampire hunters, or ancient vampires with power beyond that of the normal vamp, Venture into forgotten lands, discover the last of a forgotten race, or rather, a race that has regressed into this, and venture into a plane of oblivion, never before explored in a story that revolves around actual Elder Scrolls, something a tad strange for a franchise named Elder Scrolls, I know. Purge the unbridled evil from the land, or make damn sure they succeed by fulfilling an archaic prophecy. Dragonborn sends us back to Solstheim, an island we became familiar with in Morrowind's Blood Moon DLC, although now it's 207 years later, and a lot has changed. The main reason we're here though, a pesky Dragonborn. That's right, we're not the only Dover King anymore, and this town ain't big enough for the two of us. Explore the island all over again, seeing a whole swath of new things, and a little of the old. 
get lost in the depths of the Apocrypha, an intriguing take on a plane of oblivion, and truly learn what it means to be Dovahkiin, Dragonborn. Now, we're left with the actual Anniversary Edition itself. While not traditionally a DLC, it does add plenty of Creation Club content, which is basically a Walmart version of DLC. There are a lot of decent additions, especially visually. There are some fun little throwbacks to both Oblivion and Morrowind, but nothing is truly captivating. If you're expecting some kind of in-depth story added with the Anniversary Edition, you're going to be disappointed. Everything basically comes down to Read Journal A, which leads you to the Read Journal B, and then you're rewarded. So the ultimate question, is it worth it? As in, if you already own the Skyrim Special Edition, is it worth it to upgrade to the Anniversary Edition? Well, honestly, in my opinion, it's kind of not. You're not going to find anything super special in the Anniversary Edition that you wouldn't have found in the Special Edition plus mods. However, I will also say it is the most complete version of Skyrim. If you've somehow never played Skyrim, it's never been a better time to pick it up with the Anniversary Edition. And if you're looking to give your tithe to the almighty Todd Howard, this will hopefully be your last chance to do it via Skyrim. But for real, this game, just Skyrim as a whole, has meant a lot to me. Ever since Morrowind all the way back in 2002, I've been a huge Elder Scrolls fan. And I waited in line to get Skyrim as a midnight release for my Xbox 360 in 2011, surrounded by a bunch of sweaty, heavy breathing nerds, because my PC wasn't strong enough to handle it. I've sunk countless hours into this immersive game and have loved most of my time with it. A perfect escape from reality when I've needed it, and a welcome playground for my creativity to flourish. I was going to stay and linger on this one for quite a while, but I decided to keep it short and sweet, at least when compared to my usual. Skyrim is a game that I will always recommend, and one that I will always think of fondly. The fact it exists makes this dark world at least a little brighter. And though the next installment in the franchise is still a long ways away, Elder Scrolls 6 is still my most anticipated release for the foreseeable future. Thanks for hanging around. I'd appreciate a fatty like, sub, and bell slap. I'm not entirely sure what I'm going to be doing next, but I'll be doing something. You'll be hearing from me soon enough. And until then, have a hell of a time out there, Dragonborn.